Hi everyone, it's a rather gloomy day in Berlin today, so I guess that's the sort of day when one should be curled up with a book. Here are the three books we're going to be talking about today. We've got The Devil's Picture Book by Paul Hewson from 1970. We've got The Tarot by Alfred Douglas from 1971. And then we've got 78 Degrees of Wisdom by Rachel Pollack, which was first published in two parts in 1980 and 1983. And I want to show in this video how there is a kind of a clear line between these three books and how we start with a certain understanding of tarot in the late 60s and early 70s. And then we move towards a certain understanding of tarot in the 80s and beyond. I'm reviewing these books in a kind of critical way because I am interested in how tarot works. And I'm very interested in how um, people's ideas of tarot change over the years. You may have seen that I have reviewed 78 Degrees of Wisdom on my channel a few weeks ago and I was very critical of it then. The reason why I took a good look at it and read it very carefully and gave some quite detailed ideas about it is because I've noticed that it is very much thought of as a, as a classic book and it's, it's very much uh, pushed on the internet as, as one of the top 10 or top 5 books that you should buy if you want to learn how to read tarot. And I think that's exactly what it isn't. I, I think it's an off-putting book. And after I released my, my review of it on my channel, I received a fair amount of messages from people who'd seen my review and, and resonated. They said they had found the book very heavy going and the book had made them feel stupid. It had, it had presented tarot as something extremely complex and, and difficult to grasp and it made them feel inadequate. And some people had actually given up on tarot after reading this book and had gone back to tarot years later. I think that's a tragedy. I think that there are much better ways of looking at tarot. The point of the video I'm making today is that, you know, I ask myself, how did this book get written? And I think the roots of the book are really in um, books such as The Devil's Picture Book by Paul Hewson. Now, Paul Hewson is a writer who I wholeheartedly admire. And I think this, The Devil's Picture Book from 1970, is an extremely good book. Having said that, there are things about this book that you can question. You could say it's based on false premises. And actually, much later, in 2004, Paul Hewson himself set out to write a kind of a sequel to The Devil's Picture Book you know, 35 years later, and he wrote Mystical Origins of the Tarot. Now, this book was written after certain very important research had been done in the intervening 30 years by some brainy university people, Decker and Dummett. I've also mentioned that book in a previous video. Details in the ticker. And Paul Hewson in this book corrects the position that he took up in that book. And that's really important to know. So the main factual inaccuracy, the um, misapprehension of books that were being written in the 70s and 80s is that tarot is older than playing cards. Now, tarot isn't older than playing cards. Playing cards are older than tarot. Playing cards are really very old. <laughs> they probably come from the maybe the 11th century. No one quite knows. They might, there might be a precedent for them in China. They probably came from the Near East. Tarot cards came from Italy in the Renaissance. That's, that's much later. The second point, which is a contested point, but it's really, really crucial, is this. There was really, until quite recently in, in tarot circles, the assumption, which I think dates back to the 19th century, that tarot cards are a coded, esoterical work, like a book, which is designed to show you the way to enlightenment. Now, I don't think that's true. And I think if you read the work of Decker and Dummett, it's slightly blown out of the water. Tarot cards are rich in esoteric symbolism, but they're not constructed as an esoteric key for personal development. All attempts to prove that they are really kind of have failed. 
Tarot cards were not designed for divination either. They were designed for card playing. But people use objects for divination, don't they? We use the Bible for divination, we use tea leaves for divination, and we use playing cards for divination. So I'm not saying you can't use tarot cards for divination. I use them for divination and I, and I think they work very well. But they're not designed for divination. And I think you can see signs for that in the tarot deck. For example, the Wheel of Fortune is, is an extremely difficult card to use for divination. And in some books, people just, you know, forget to talk about it. In, in this book, Paul Hewson just forgets to give divinatory meanings for the Wheel of Fortune because he can't think of any. Now, what happened as you went from the, the 19th century into the 20th century is that C.G. Jung started to bring esoteric ideas into respectable intellectual life. He, he uh, talked about synchronicity. He later wrote a book called Synchronicity. He was very interested in the I Ching. Um, he didn't specifically talk about tarot cards, but he talked about archetypes quite a lot. Now, this had an enormous impact on thought, especially in the hippie era. And hippies generally, I think, were very Jungian people because it seemed that there was a way of, of including spirituality and including, in a sense, the paranormal in a, in a respectable intellectual framework. Now, Paul Hewson is, is very Jungian. Paul Hewson is also famous for having published a book about witchcraft in the 70s, and that apparently was quite scandalous at the time. He was making witchcraft itself intellectually respectable. So Paul Hewson has a very wide esoteric interest. He's extremely brainy. He's, he's a, a, a very thorough researcher and he's a very good writer. Of the three authors I'm talking about today, Paul Hewson is by far the best writer and the most thorough researcher. Now, interestingly enough, by the time you get to the end of this book, you have the feeling that he's not passionate about tarot itself. I think he's passionate about the old religion. He's passionate about paganism. He's passionate about mysticism in the sense of connecting directly to God or to the higher intelligence of the universe. He uh, has no interest in the minor arcana at all. He talks about the major arcana in great detail. But when he writes a chapter about a major arcana card, he will actually go off and talk about a goddess or the devil or um, a sacrificial tradition. And actually this book is really about the old religion. It's really about paganism. And that is hooked onto the subject of tarot. I think it's a, a very early case of an author respectabilizing tarot. And it's not thoroughly done. It's a, it's a very good book, but it doesn't quite wholeheartedly deal with tarot. Paul Hewson's not particularly good uh, when he's talking about tarot reading. He's very good talking about tarot symbolism. He's not particularly interesting about tarot spreads. And his divinatory meanings that he gives in this book are, are, are frankly not good. Certainly, you know, for people living in the 21st century, they're old fashioned. And a lot of his divinatory meanings for the major arcana are like I Ching meanings. In other words, they could work. If you just drew one card and it was one major arcana card, for example, he'll say, oh, this card means you are coming to a crucial point in your life and you must do this, this and this. And this other card means you are coming to a crucial crossroads and you must do this, this and this. And all of them really um, invite you to uh, become more Jungian and, and, and to look at your life in this sense of an archetypal journey. So... Um, if, like me, you want to use the tarot every day, if, like me, you want to help other people, help queerants to sort out their lives and to get a bit of mental clarity with the tarot, you can't really use these kind of meanings because they're too big, you know? You, you might have five cards on the table and all the five cards are saying you have reached a major crossroads in your life and, and it won't do. Having said that, I heartily recommend this book. Paul Hewson's a great writer and there is a lot in this book about paganism. And it's very clear to see why this book was so interesting and um, so welcome when it came out in 1970. Okay, now next up is, is The Tarot by Alfred Douglas. And I need to be kind to this book because this is the book that, that I learned tarot with. It was the only tarot book that I had for about 30 years. 
and it was only in later life that I began to research tarot properly. So I was able to read tarot. I think anyone can read tarot without any book at all. I think tarot is an excuse to be um, intuitive. I've had brief skimmed looks at this book over the years and I've thought, oh, good old book. I love it. I learned the tarot with it. And again, I mean, there is re another reason to love this book, which is that it gave rise to the, the Sheridan Douglas Tarot, which I've also reviewed, which I like. It's a very eccentric, but quite influential deck. And I kind of recommend the deck now more than I recommend the book. I've had a very, a very careful look at this book and I have regretfully looked at it with a severe critical eye. And um, it's not very good. It's from 1971. It's a year after the Paul Houston book. So I think it's fair to say that this book is not directly influenced by Paul Houston's book. I think both books come from the same milieu. They're both written by English people. So this is the, the, the London um, sort of post golden dawn Jung reading uh, circle in the late 60s and early 70s. And Alfred Douglas does have a pretty good pedigree. He was taught by someone who was taught by the Golden Dawn. So he's really connected with, with that tradition. He is not as sharp a writer as Paul Hewson. There's a lot of research going on. There's a huge bibliography at the back. And you get the feeling that this is someone who reads very widely, but the information is not really very well processed and very well presented. You know, he, he, he starts off by saying, Tarot is older than playing cards. And then about three pages later, he says, um, of course, maybe tarot isn't older than playing cards. And, and he, love, he loves to say, certain people think this about tarot, but it's not true. So it's, his position is kind of wishy-washy. Considering he's done so much research, he doesn't really have a position of his own. The book is m a much better how-to book than Paul Husen's book, which really isn't a how-to book at all. The book does enable you to learn tarot. It, it, it has specially commissioned illustrations in it, which later became a tarot deck in their own right. I think the book is quite good about the minor arcana. It's not, again, with the major arcana, it's, it's old fashioned. It's every card is like, oh, major turning points in your life. Oh, the darkness must be transformed into light. The ego must be dissolved all those sort of post Jungian ideas, which are not terribly helpful if they're presented in a sort of, in, in, in sound bites like that. And I don't think they're very helpful in the context of tarot anyway. To give you an example of, of how woolly the writing is in this, he's talking about the magician and he describes the, this card as, as symbolizing the emerging self-awareness of the child and the beginning of the journey through life his first task will be to learn how to live in his environment. So he says, you know, this card symbolizes the child who knows nothing. And in the next paragraph, he says, traditionally, the magician is the adept who has brought all facets of his being into conscious equilibrium. Well, you can't have it both ways. Either the magician symbolizes the open mind of the child, or it symbolizes the adept who has his mind completely under control. And no, it's not sharp. The court card descriptions are not good either. So really, you know, you have a good a romp through the pip cards, which is, I think, extremely helpful for a, for a new reader. And if you just had this book, you would have to make do with some kind of woolly definitions of the major arcana and the court cards. Now, as I was rereading this book, I gradually realized what it was that was bothering me about the early Paul Houston writings, this book, and Rachel Pollack taking up the torch in this book. And it is this, the Golden Dawn claimed when they, you know, when they um, rebooted Tarot, they claimed that they were restoring Tarot to its original esoteric um, state as it was sometime in prehistory, as it was in ancient Egypt or whatever you like. So let's connect it up with astrology. Let's connect it up with Kabbalah. Let's, let's, let's change the order of the cards a bit and let's, let's call the Pope the Hierophant, let's call the Papess the High Priestess, and so forth. And they were saying, this is how tarot used to be, you know, this is how ancient tarot was. And, and this clearly just isn't true. It cannot be backed up by, by any evidence. And, and that has basically come to light around the 2000s. 
And I think that's really important because, because the idea that tarot is esoteric combined with a sort of a Jungian approach to, to esoteric things results in some really complicated trains of thought. And, and it basically results in this, which, which I think is, is vastly overcomplicated and, and vastly confusing. Like Paul Hewson, Alfred Douglas, I think, treats tarot cards a bit like I Ching hexagrams. He doesn't really open the subject up so that you can read them in a, in a relaxed and modern way. I also want to say something about the esoteric school of thought generally. And I kind of want to explain myself as to why I'm, I'm moaning and groaning about it. And, and why, you know, why don't I just shut up and be more esoteric? Well, I'll tell you why. When you read these two books, and indeed also this one, the authors don't really come out of the closet and say it, but occasionally you catch them at it. And there is an underlying, usually unspoken idea that only initiated people will survive death. The, the authors like to talk about, you know, if we, if we have our personal development, if we have our esoteric development, we will achieve the Holy Grail. We will achieve the prize. Um, we will become enlightened, this and that and the other. But occasionally you catch them using the word immortality. Now, I'm really against that idea. I think that we are all immortal. Um, I think we all survive death. I think no matter how much we screw up our lives, no matter how unconscious we are, no matter how unesoteric we are, and no matter how little personal development we do, we are fine after death. We are absolutely fine. I think the idea that we are not fine is the idea behind the world's major religions. And the one religion I haven't researched is Hinduism. Um, but I have noticed that even in Buddhism, there is the, the feeling that you're not fine unless you have done a little bit of work on yourself. And if that's the case, then paganism and this kind of esoteric study is similar to religion in that it is based on a fear of death. And as I've, as I've pointed out in, in my review of the Rachel Pollack book, um, this book seems to um, assume that we are ignorant, unenlightened creatures um, and there is something wrong with us. Now, I don't think there is anything wrong with us. I think we should get on with our lives and do our best and then die and then have another one. But to, to carry on with my thesis, Rachel Pollack's book is, I think, clearly influenced by Alfred Douglas. She refers several times in her book to a mysterious tarot writer called Paul Douglas. But um, when you look at the, the bibliography at the back, she then does credit Alfred Douglas. I find it quite interesting that when she gets Alfred Douglas's name wrong, she calls him Paul. And I wonder whether that means that she did actually read the Paul Hewson book. She doesn't credit Paul Hewson in her bibliography, but uh, yeah, Paul Douglas. I won't go into great detail about 78 Degrees of Wisdom because I have reviewed it in quite some detail. But I think in a sense, Rachel Pollack took the ball and ran with it. Her book is um, in entirely Jungian and it's absolutely uh, obsessed with the idea that th the tarot is a coded esoteric work. It's like a course in enlightenment that we, that we take one step at a time. I think the book is not incredibly coherent and I think it's a book which, as I've said, puts the modern reader off tarot. Um, I, I, I just disagree with more or less everything in it. So what, what I really am proposing in this video is that, um, is that it is important to take a deep breath and to acknowledge that tarot is not a very ancient thousand-year-old tradition for example, like astrology, that it doesn't predate the playing cards. It comes from what they now call early modern times, doesn't it? It comes from the Renaissance. I think it's important to, to let go of the idea that, that tarot is intrinsically connected to other esoteric disciplines. It may be connected in terms of its symbolism, and I like the esoteric symbolism in tarot and I use it, but at the end of the day, it's a pack of playing cards and I think the healthiest attitude towards it is just to, to pick it up and do more or less what you want with it and get into the symbolism. You know, read lovely books like this. 
but then kind of let it go and don't be browbeaten into thinking that there is a truth about how these symbols work and there is a truth about how the structure of tarot works. And if you can just find this truth, it will help you to get enlightenment. Um, I think that's nonsense. I think it's an oppressive idea because you're, you're chasing after a holy grail which you're not going to find. What I like about pre-Golden Dawn tarot reading is that it's, it's a popular form. It's relaxed. Uh, it's associated with gypsies, uh, Romanies, rightly or wrongly. But what I like is that tarot was invented as a playing card deck. And then people looked at it and thought, that's great. We can use it for divination. So they picked it up and ran with it. It's very much a homemade form. You know, the pre-Golden Dawn meanings of tarot cards are, are pretty random and they're not structured. And it doesn't all fit in with these uh, Kabbalistic progressions and numerological progressions. It's a bit scattered, but it's fun. And these pre-Golden Dawn meanings still exist. They're still embedded, for example, in the Rider Waite Smith. I'm into them. I'm into any ammunition I can get. But let's be free about tarot. Let's do it in our own way. Let's do it the way we want to do it. Let's have fun with it. You know, if you are so inclined, just throw all the books away and pick up a, a pack of tarot cards that you like and just uh, make up your own meanings. Personally, I'm not that um, liberated myself. I do like reading tarot books and I do like knowing what cards have meant over the years. But what I want to tell you is that Every tarot reader in the end forms his or her own lexicon of meanings, you know. And as you read the cards and relate it to your experience during the day, other, other meanings will just naturally occur to you and you will work that into your personal lexicon. So my message to us is maybe to relax and have fun with it and let the intuition come. Okay, that's all for now, folks. See you next week. Bye. O oh, yeah. oh, moon, when I gaze at thy beautiful face, careening about through the boundaries of space, a question comes frequently into my mind. Will I ever gaze on thy glorious behind?